Well, the time has come for another exploratory expedition into the book of Leviticus. Today we are in Leviticus chapter 20. I will have to put out a parental advisory on this chapter for some of the things that we're going to talk about. Looking forward to being able to monetize some of these YouTube videos, but that probably requires getting out of Leviticus. <laughs> but anyway, uh, thanks for, uh, for tuning in, and these handouts are free on our website at tobelikechrist.com. When did the events of Leviticus chapter 20, uh, when did they take place? The Israelites left slavery in Egypt about 1491 BC. This took place, these laws were given probably about a year after that, after the tabernacle had been erected, which would place us about 1490 BC. Moving down now into our definition section, the first term we need to define is Molech. The name Molech appears several times in the Bible and is referred to as the abomination of the Ammonites in the book of 1 Kings. Molech was an, an idol that was worshipped by the Canaanites, and the worship of Molech involved burning children as sacrifices to him, according to 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 10. Any Israelite who was caught offering their child to Molech was to be put to death, according to chapter 2 of this chapter, or verse 2 of this chapter. The second term we're going to define is necromancer, which I believe we saw in the last chapter. This is someone who uses magic to conjure spirits of the dead. In this chapter, we've got 27 verses, and a lot of the things that are going to be talked about in this chapter have already been talked about in some of the previous chapters, so I've done a little bit of, of summary here. Our first section, verses 1 through 9, child sacrifice, mediums, and necromancers. If any Israelite or person living amongst the Israelite was found to be sacrificing their child to Molech, that person was to be killed by stoning. Additionally, God was going to punish anyone who had knowledge of someone else who was sacrificing to Molech and didn't report it. So if one of your family members was doing it, you were required to report them and they would receive the death penalty. The Hebrews were forbidden from consulting with mediums and necromancers. We saw that in the last chapter. God told Moses that he would set his face against anyone who participated in these things and that they would be cut off from their people. Now, in verses 10 through 21, we're going to talk about laws regarding sexual immorality. So several kinds of sexual immorality were punishable with capital punishment. Adultery, sexual relations between close relatives, homosexuality, and bestiality. Relationships between stepbrothers and stepsisters were forbidden as disgraceful. Relationships with aunts, uncles, nieces, and nephews were prohibited. Relationships with, or, or sexual relations with a woman during her menstrual period was for, forbidden. And then finally, there would be no sexual relationships between brother-in-laws and sister-in-laws. You might think these are common sense, but even in the history of Israel that we've already read, Jacob, his 12 sons, a lot of these things went on. So it was important for these to be clarified for the nation moving forward. And then finally, verses 22 through 27, holiness versus uncleanliness. The Israelites were supposed to shun the pagan practices and immoralities of the nations who lived in Canaan before them. God gave them these laws, commands, and restrictions to separate them from those nations, according to verse 24. If the Israelites would keep God's commands and strive for holiness, then Canaan would not, quote, vomit them out like it was going to do to its current inhabitants because of their wickedness and their sins. God says in verse 26, quote, You shall be holy to me, for I the Lord am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. And so there you go, Leviticus chapter 20. Now for our application. As we just mentioned, God's laws in the Old Testament were intended to separate his people from the surrounding nations. And this intention is repeated in the commands of Jesus and in his apostles. For example, you can see 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. Christians are to be separate from the world. God wants a distinct people, a special people, that stand out against the backdrop of a sinful culture. As those who want to be disciples of Jesus, we should embrace and come to terms with the fact that we are not going to look like the people around us. They pattern their lives off of the things that the world idolizes. We pattern our lives after the holiness of Jesus. It should not be our mission to make a disciple look as similar to an unbeliever as possible. It should not be our mission to make the life of a disciple more palatable to an unbelieving world.
Rather, we should embrace the privilege of stepping into the unique identity that God has prepared for us and realize that our differences are a good thing, a holy thing.